Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. We are going to teach you today how to go with the flow. Now people talk about it, but it's uh, it takes some work to actually figure out how to do it. And so we have uh, Mary O'Malley who is going to be talking about her book, What's in the Way is the Way, Moving Beyond Your Struggle into the Joy of Being Fully Alive. So welcome, Mary. Oh, so glad to be here with you, too. Now, I've really, um, I've been using your book, and what's interesting is my um, son is now in middle school, and he's graduating into high school. Now, um, what would have happened in the past before I've done all this spiritual work is I would kind of unconsciously race through the whole thing. And this time around, I'm conscious, I'm more aware of my body sensations, which is something that you talk about in your book, and my thoughts. And... Um, even after all this work I've done, I found myself, here's what happened last week. I was reading this book like, okay, all right, I don't want to do this. <laughs> you know, it's like, I'm like, no, 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 it's about, you know, and I think that actually whenever you go through any transition, and I said to my husband, I said, you know what, unlike in the past when you have to force yourself to let go. I just want to let go willingly. I want to not struggle and through this transition, but to kind of openly embrace this transition and move to a graceful place. But I, I found myself reading your book like this. <laughs> And actually, this is how it began. And then I would kind of begrudgingly go through the chapters because I think what happens is that when you're in the thick of things, you right. talk about this in your book as resisting the discomfort versus going into it. And when I finally relaxed into going, in, you know, going into it, which literally took a week, I'm in a much better place today, which is the day of my son's graduation, which was perfectly divinely timed. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, a lot of the really important ideas. In fact, I was just talking to my husband about your book because he has been, one of his life missions is to live with consciousness, which is what I think the book really is about. Yes. Right? It's like, how do you become more conscious? Yes. And you describe it as um, living with life or living through life. As life. As life. Yeah, for, or going with the flow, or Wu Wei, or letting go. There's like a thousand words to describe what this is. Um, but ultimately, I think it's about being conscious, right? Exactly. Yeah. And most of us are really, truly unconscious. And what I mean by that is we're stuck in our heads. Yes. And, and there's a wonderful metaphor. In, in the, the book begins with this metaphor. Imagine a meadow. And of course, I live in the Northwest, and you know I love to backpack up on Mount Rainier with all these gorgeous meadows and you know this white, you know exquisitely beautiful mountain and these mm -hmm. little babbling brooks and marmots all over the place and wildflowers. Everything in that meadow flows. Mm -hmm. Day flows into night, winter into spring, uh, birth into death, and. Uh, light flows, sound flows, water flows. There's nothing in that meadow that resists the flow. <laughs> you and I lived as that flow when we were very young. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very hard to imagine, but there was a time when there was no thoughts in our head. Yes, no, I remember. <laughs> Not at once. Yeah. We were available to life. Mm -hmm. But most of us were raised by unconscious giants that we thought were gods. Mm -hmm. Our parents. And, yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, they did things that wounded us. You know, there's two core wounds. One is invasion and one is abandonment. Mm. And so in this openness, we began to hold on. There's a study done once of children and their breathing patterns. All the children were breathing their natural breath. Like, you know how dogs and cats breathe? You know, their whole trunk breathes? Mm -hmm. Not Before they went to preschool, not one of them, CJ, was breathing their natural breath by the time they made it to first grade. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, but, well, we have to look at it in the bigger picture, and hopefully yeah. we'll get to that later. So here, the clouds flow through the skies. We live in this meadow. But slowly and surely, they lower and lower until they begin to swirl around our 
head. Mm -hmm. And this is what I call the clouds of struggle. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. we were available to life and then we got scared out of life and we learned how to hold on to our breath and tighten our body and we ran away to our heads, to a conceptual world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. two really important things to get out of this. Number one, this conceptual world is made out of fear. And if you had a little door, you could open it up and watch the ticker tape of your 65,000 thoughts a day. <laughs> you could see most of them are all based on fear. I mean, it could be, you know, I don't like the look of my hair today or yeah. something like that. But, it, of course, it, it blossoms into bigger fears. This is what keeps us caught in the cloud bank. And the cloud bank is always liking and disliking and thinking this is good and that is bad and that is right and that is wrong. And if I just get rid of this and get a hold of this, then everything will be okay. Now, we've never left the meadow. That's <laughs> thing is we've never left the meadow yeah we're in that meadow of flow of peace of joy that is our natural birthright okay so i want to go into the clouds i want to go into the clouds a little bit because i think um one of the key things about the clouds would you call us spells i mean they're actually they're going into the, spells. Yes. yeah they're fears of which um the fears include i'm separate from life the giants teach us you know our parents teach us life teaches right. it as an early age, which causes us to not breathe properly and to forget yeah. the meadow is that I'm separate from life. Life is not safe. Right. I must control life. So those are kind of foundation, like those two ideas of I'm not separate from life and life is not safe, then set up these operations, these, these other spells that think, well, because that's so, I got to control life. Yes. I must do everything right because somehow yes. I'm not right enough. Yes. Which then leads to another set of spells that were that lie deep with our unconscious. You call them our hidden spells. That right. I'm wrong. I'm unlovable, and I'm alone. So there's this whole catastrophic <laughs> structure that gets set up as part of these clouds. Now, I guess the question, and, and what's interesting, and I think that these, it, um, there's lots of different ways of describing this. I, I um, tend to like the Enneagram moons, you know, they talk about this, but it's the same kind of thing. We get separated from the divine and we start believing these fearful beliefs and we lose sight of these spiritual beliefs. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, what happens, like one of the fixing strategies, which I think are so interesting. One is um, having to control things, and the other thing is about fixing things. Right. And I love your passages about both. So talk to us a little bit about these operating strategies and spells and what that what behavior ensues as a result. <laughs> I uh, did a further articulation, uh, not in, in this book, but Sounds True is publishing it in January. And so I did a further articulation in the meadow metaphor. An alien lands <laughs> right on the planet, right next to your meadow. Okay. And he sees this cloud bank moving all around the meadow in really frenetic ways. Right. And he can see feet and he can see hands. But he can't see you because you're enclosed in all your spells. Right. And in one hand is a butterfly net. And it's this this core belief that if I just catch the enough butterflies and the right kind of butterflies, you know, if I lose weight, if I make more money, if I if I uh, uh, change my get a more perfect mate, whether I divorce right. this one or change the one I have, and it, we careen around constantly trying to get to what we want, mm -hmm. and. That every once in a while it does work for a short period of time. We lose the 20 pounds, you know, and then we start smoking. You know? Right. <laughs> but in the other hand is a fly swatter. If we just get rid of what we, if we just get a good nose job so our nose will finally look, you know, right. okay. Or if we, you know, uh, stop uh, being so shy or right. whatever it is. And he just sees you running around trying to swat things away and grab things. <laughs> it, it's just a very, well, I say in my book, The Gift of Our Compulsions, our core compulsion is to struggle. And mm -hmm. that's what that image helps us to see. 
And what happens because in the long run, this doesn't work? Mm -hmm. Because getting the clouds to be a particular way will not bring you the peace you long for. You're already the peace you long for. You just don't see it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's so important to get that how we recognize the meadow. We don't come back to the meadow. We recognize the meadow Mm -hmm. by seeing these clouds. And that's why I made the list of spells. But there's one other thing that needs to be added here. That when all this trying and resisting and wanting and fixing and uh, managing and controlling and judging doesn't work, then we oftentimes go to our compulsions. We have to numb out. Right. You know, whether Can't deal with it. Yeah, busyness or heroin or, you know, over-exercising or whatever. We have to numb ourselves out because we're homesick for the meadow. Mm, okay, so I have a real-life example that I wanted to use of a person that I know that is in the meadow, and the aliens have flown in, and right. she's she's in a situation where... Um, and in a situation where a lot of young people find themselves, she um, made a decision based on pleasing her parents to uh, become a, uh, a medical doctor. And then she really didn't want to be, she kind of thought that, and everyone's like, yo, good, be a medical doctor. And so she went and uh, didn't get into the college that she wanted to. So then applied to another college without thinking about what school would be a good fit for her. She just applied, got a scholarship, went to that school. And then thought, oh, I can't pay for it. So then she took in, you know, $13,000 loan that then turned to a $50,000 loan. And she found out that actually she didn't really like being in medical school. (laughs) school. Like she didn't want to do that path. Then decided that the last time she was happy was when she was in high school writing. So then she decided to switch and become an English major. And then this friend of mine decided to then uh, become a... English major had to take in another fifty thousand dollars of debt. She's now a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Um, didn't take an internship to get a sense of whether she even wanted to be a, an English major, but found herself faced with a hundred thousand dollars of debt and having to figure out what to do. Which is so much of what's happening today with college kids, right? They're saddled with debt. They're having to take on jobs that pay a lot of money so they can get out of debt, but then they may not even be doing the things that you want. So here she is, you know, now in a place of struggle, right? She's feeling impatient. She's feeling worried. Her minds are filled, her mind is filled with doubt and anxiety because she has this $100,000 loan and sadness because she can't even do the thing that she wants, you know? So this is a real life example. How do these spells apply in that example? Well, you can see she's living out of fear, the fear of displeasing. Right. You know, uh, the fear now of, oh, my God, you know, all of this debt, uh, this fear that I'm not following my right path. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very strange that when we are caught in this mind, we really, truly believe it's in charge of life. Mm -hmm. And it's a very, very painful way to live. Mm -hmm. Life is in charge of life, and what we long for more than anything is to come back into the flow of life. Oftentimes, what brings us back into the flow of life is great discomfort. Mm -hmm. It's when we have gone as far as we can in trying to do our life in our minds Mm -hmm. that lies the possibility of beginning to be curious, of beginning to become still enough that you can begin to listen to yourself. Mm. And that hundred thousand dollars, you know, if she can see that it is not there because she did it wrong, right? But it is there as a part of her journey of awakening. All of a sudden, this all becomes workable. So what I wrote in the book, and this came in just one fell swoop as I was writing, life is set up to bring up what has been bound up. Which has been what? Bound bound up. Ah, okay, got it. So it can open up to be freed up so you can show up 
for life. Hmm. Now, she's a young woman. She was trying college uh, to become a medical doctor and now possibly a writer. But even more than that, she is life waking up to itself. And I have a couple of armchairs on the moon that I love to invite people to come and sit. <laughs> and look, popcorn with endless butter on it. And right. Look at that. And you begin to see the unfolding of life on this planet and the unfolding of the universe. And you realize we are evolution. And it, it is a very good thing to come across something you can't control. Something that just creates a meltdown in the mind because then there is the possibility of beginning to be curious about your mm. mind, to learn how to relate to it rather than from it. And that's how you discover the meadow of your being and discover why you were given life in the first place. Mm. You know, so in your book, um, What's in the Way is the Way, you bring up a lot of interesting ideas on how you know if you're kind of this fear generation, if you are in the clouds. And yeah. what's interesting is we were talking the other day, this friend of mine, and she's literally almost, ex she's literally experiencing every single thing on your list. Sadly. Yes. She's no, 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 not sadly. No, 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 no. Okay, no. what? It's so important to get that, that, when we come across something we can't control, it has to be that big. I asked Eckhart Tolle once, I said, does it take suffering in order to awaken, in order to come out of these clouds, to live from our authentic selves? Oh my goodness, that's what we long for, more than we long to be a writer or you know, to not have debt or whatever. And, uh, and he said no. But then he said something along this line, the collective unconsciousness is so thick, it is going to be mainly people that have taken on a lot of suffering that will begin to wake up in the middle of it and be in relationship with it in an entirely new way that will bring you back to the meadow. Mm, you just gave me chills all over. I got chills all over yeah. my arms because I think that that is... Ultimately, so in, in reframing as to this is a wonderful gift given to you, like my dad's death, right, which was hard at the time, was yes. was an incredible gift because it forced me to just, it was so bad and I was struggling yes. so much and it forced me to kind of reach a point of opening up to the meadow. So similarly, you're saying, how can she, you know, she's actually... She has this compulsive worrying that's happening. The, the things that you mentioned in your book, she has a compulsive worrying. Oh my gosh, how am I going to get out of the debt? So it's this constant soundtrack. Yeah. 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 And she's actually starting to get sick, which is yes, another thing. Right. She's starting to get like issues with her body. She's constantly feeling like a sense of tension. And she's probably, you know, she's clearly struggling with her finances. And then she's involving, there's all these stories. You talk about these stories about. Gosh, I feel so bad. It's a, and the thing that you're talking about in, in these hidden spells, I am feel so bad. I, I feel bad and guilty and shameful because I shouldn't be in this position. Yeah, wrong and unlovable. It's just so amazing to learn how to do what I call look to end unhook. Okay. Because this is where you become what I call a tightness detective. Let's go back to the meadow. <laughs> okay. Everything in the meadow flows. That's who we really are. We are life that has appeared in this form for a short period of time and will disappear again. Mm -hmm. But everything flows in life except this thing up here. It mm -hmm. resists. And the more you kind of get a sense of what it's like to open your breath again, soften your belly, allow your heart to engage with life, you feel this flow. And you are in connection with it. And then when you go back up into this spell-based mind, and you can see it in her world, she's worrying, and she's, you know, what did I do wrong, and what's wrong with me, and I'm stupid and dumb and all that. All of that is this world that makes you tight. Mm. So you become a tightness detective. Mm. You to become more alert to when you are holding your breath in. And when I first recognized this, my kids were very little, and uh, we were sitting and watching uh, 
uh, one was on one side, one was on the other side, we're watching Wile E. Coyote on the television. <laughs> yeah. And, oh my God, I was just, you know, you know, oh, you know, you know, you know, you know. And I began to watch this television program with them and then ensuing television programs, now doing what I call the U-turn, mm -hmm. the Y-O-U-turn. I began to notice what brings up tightness inside of me. And I began to become curious. And just like, let's say that you're having a very difficult day and you go to a friend and that friend does with you what we usually do with our difficulties. Oh, get off of it. Or get over just, it. Go plow yeah. through it. Yeah. Uh, or she ignores you or she hands you a bottle of wine or, yeah. you know, whatever. Now, imagine you go to a friend that says, tell me about it. And you can feel her sincerity. And she just listens to you. That bound up energy relaxes. Mm. And, you know, after 15 minutes, you feel so much better. She didn't even say anything. <laughs> That's the power of your own attention. That's why I say you've never left the meadow. That you just think you have. And what my job is to do is to help you become curious about all this tightness inside of you, all this have to and should and can and won't mm -hmm. and I'm, I, you know, resistance and controlling and it all based on fear. The more you can see that, the more it lets go. Uh, okay, so let's actually use some of this in, in her particular example. So, so you're saying that there's two things that you talk about in your book, the way in the way what's in the way is the is way the, I'm talking about with her what's in the way is the way she has this challenge or a number of challenges it isn't here because she's done something wrong right. it isn't here because her parents made her it isn't here because god fell asleep on the job it is life saying pay attention to this i am showing you the way out of the maze not mm -hmm. by doing it but by seeing the maze. Mm. Okay, so here's what happened when I was talking to her is I was saying, so where do you feel it? And she said, you know, she felt it in her, yeah. she said, she said, it feels like two metal plates squashing my, my body, my brain. And I just feel like I feel tightness in my heart and I feel my shoulders tensing up. It's the, it's the thing that you're talking. It's the con second. contracting place. And, um, and we talked about it. We talked a lot about like, so what does it feel like? How does it, and then I said, what is it saying to you? And you know, the voices were just awful. You know I mean? They were like, you're stupid. Why are you doing this? I'm, I'm shameful to my parents. I just feel so awful. I hate the people at work, you know, all just got a litany of, of spells, of spells. Right. But they were there. And and at one point she said, you know, I, I've been feeling all these things and I have, this is the first time, like she's been feeling these things for six months. Right. And it's the first time that she had actually said those things. And so there's a healing, right? This is what you talk about, healing with your heart. There's healing with just voicing these yes. inner voices, right? It helps to sometimes voice them to somebody else. That's why I do, you know, individual sessions with people or groups. It's just very amazing to be around a group of people that all realizes we're all nutty as fruitcakes. <laughs> all have gotten caught in these spells. And so it is learning the art of being curious. There's two qualities that we're, we're exploring in this book. The power of curiosity. Oh my God, oh my God, I'm so anxious. Oh, anxiousness is here. Mm -hmm. the First is being caught in unconsciousness. You are reacting to what is going on inside of you. The second is consciousness. You are relating to it. Oh, the scared one is here. Mm. The other quality is compassion, or I sometimes call it spaciousness. It's the ability to touch with your heart all of these spells that you took on that so keep you caught in your head and tighten your body and the more you step out of them mm -hmm. the more you see how young this storyteller mm. is that all these spells were frozen inside of you before you were six right. so, <laughs> so true 
the last big argument you had with your mate or your friend and just remember how young you got, maybe yeah, exactly. during it or maybe even afterwards. That's because the spells were activated and the spells need somebody to say, I see you. Right. I see you. I see that you're scared or you're ashamed or you're lonely or whatever. All of those are spells. And I love the word spell mm. because it's something that's laid over the top of you. It's not true and it can be lifted. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is, uh, when you wake up enough, you begin to see most people live in spells most all the time that they don't even have a comprehension that these spells aren't them. Right. They are just something that has been conditioned. This, I'm displeasing my parents. Oh my God, I'll never make enough money to pay off the $100,000. All of this is the fear and the shame of the spells. And we can look and un. Oh, mm, okay, so I want to go through some of the exercises. And there, what I love about the exercises in, in your book is you're so simple. So we're talking to Mary O'Malley. We're talking about what's in the way is the way. And you talk about just a simple exercise. I was wondering if you could lead us through and using this gal's example. Because I think all of us, whether it's this gal's example, my example of me suffering through my children's transition, these are still the same processes. So there's yes. one where you put your hand on your heart. Would you mind leading us through oh. that? Yes, yes. So it's so important. Breath is one of our absolute greatest friends. So I invite you not to do anything with your breath. Just notice what your breath is like right now. Mm -hmm. Just notice it. And mostly it's going to be fairly shallow. And then I want you to imagine there's a candle, a lit candle right in front of your mouth, maybe about six inches out there, and breathe in through your nose. And then gently blow the candle out through your mouth. And then in through your nose. And begin to allow that blowing out of the candle to be a little bit longer each time. In through the nose. Out through the mouth as we blow out the candle in a long, slow, deep out breath. So do this for just a few breaths on your own rhythm. Let's do that together as we begin to open our breath. It's just amazing. We can see how much we're holding. So on the next in breath, tighten, tighten everything you can find in your body. And on the out breath, very slowly. Uh, let's do this for a couple more breaths on your own rhythm. Tighten, tighten, tighten. Now allow your breath to be as it wants to be, but notice, is your experience different? Can you feel that your breath may be a little bit more open? Your nervous system may be a little calmer. There may be more energy moving through you. Even if you don't notice that, that is happening. Because we're opening what is being closed through our breath. Now bring your attention to the center of your chest. Here is your main brain. It's your heart mm -hmm. And science has now shown us this is our main brain. And this is inclusive. The head is exclusive. This is compassionate. The head is judgmental. So we want to wake up this heart center. And imagine there's a little nose right there in the center of your chest and breathe in and out. Right there in the center of your chest, breathe in and then breathe out. 
waking up this heart center that knows that you are okay exactly as you are and all is well. And now if your hand is not on your heart, bring it there. And have this be the hand of tenderness. The hand that meets you in a much different way than your mind usually does. This hand represents the ability to meet yourself in your heart. Be kind with you. You took on a lot of spells when you were very young, and you've been lost in them. But now life is showing you the pathway out of the spells and back into your heart. So for a few more breaths, just focus on this hand. Feel that touching ourselves in this way evokes tenderness. It evokes kindness. And you will discover the more that you awaken, you will finally see that there's absolutely nothing inside of you to be ashamed of or afraid of. Everything is asking to be woven back into the healing of your own heart. Just feel the tenderness. And if you can't, notice what the mind is doing with it. All is work. And when you're ready, open your eyes. Mm, that's really beautiful. Mm. Very beautiful. I also like um, in your book when you say, I see you. I'm here yes. for you, honey. It's okay. You know, I... Um, so I've been saying that to the part of me that fears transition. You know, life is impermanent. And, you know, and so I'm thinking how I can see using us is taking those thoughts, you know. Oh, my God, my kids are growing away. They're leaving. I'm no longer a mom. I'm going to be shifting. Where am I going to go? I'm no longer a mom. What am I? You know, all those spells. And just going, oh, it's okay, honey. I hear you. I know you're scared. It's going to be okay. Or this friend of mine who is saying, you know, I have a huge amount of debt. I don't know how I'm going to get out of it. I completely have no freedom because I have to take these jobs I don't like. It's like, I know, honey. It's hard. I see you. Tell me more. You're what bringing else? the aware heart to the spells that have gotten embedded in your head. Mm. It is the heart that heals them. It is the heart that doesn't fight with them, that doesn't try to fix them. Mm -hmm. And we go back to that example of our friend who met us in just simple awareness. Mm -hmm. Things begin to move. This will never bring the healing we long for, this fixing, changing, rearranging, getting rid of, rising above, judging, controlling. Yeah. We have thought that if we just do it good enough then everything would be okay. Right. For moments, it does seem okay, and then it falls apart again because we're not living from our heart. Yeah, we're living in the net. I want, I want, swatting things I away. Want, so we're all kind want. of, yeah. And, you know, it's very interesting. It, it, my Hawaii retreat I led a few years ago, the whole theme was all is welcome here because mm -hmm. that's what we're beginning to understand, that what heals is meaning, allowing, giving space to. Fixing and changing does not. And so I put these signs all over the retreat center. Um, all is welcome here. Mm -hmm. And somebody came in on the second day and said, you know what I read when I read that? All is well come here. Mm. And that's what the heart knows. Mm. Evan Alexander, who was the neurosurgeon from Harvard, who wrote Proof of Heaven, who is in a seven-day coma, and then is now sharing with the world what he experienced in that coma, 
The first words he said when he woke up from his coma to his sister were, all is well. Feel this. This mind will absolutely never agree with that. No, it's not. I have to fix that. I know. And what about ISIS? Right. What about... No starving children and, right. and, 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 you know, oh, the water table. Oh, my goodness, what's going to happen to the water? Oh, there's going to be wars. This is what the mind says. This is all is not well, and you've got to fix it, and it's an endless game. Right. This, and this is the main brain. The science has shown this, that this is the, the main brain. This is our core guide in life. And this knows how to unhook from the game of struggle all as well. That doesn't mean that you sit down by the side of the road. That doesn't mean you say, oh, all is well, so I don't care. Yeah, whatever. I take over the world. Yeah. You know, no. <laughs> it means that when you live from this, you react. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's like last summer when the Palestinians uh, uh, kidnapped and killed three Israeli teenagers. So the Israeli, they went and captured a Palestinian teacher, teenager and burnt him alive. Mm -hmm. This is the level of unconsciousness that's asking to be healed on this planet. Mm -hmm. And it's only this heart that knows how to do it. Mm -hmm. So when we move from the mind, we move from reaction. You killed our teenagers, we're going to kill your teenager. When you move from the heart, when you know all is well, when you know life knows what it's doing, even with all of this chaos, and in all great evolutionary shifts, as the old is dying and the new is being born, and that's what we're living in now, there's always chaos. Right. But the heart knows whether you call it the divine or God, I call it life, you know, the angels, whatever. They know what they're doing. Mm. Um, all is well. Come here. Mm. All right. I want to go through the other part that you talked about, which is curiosity. And let's actually step through some. Um, so there are a bunch of questions. Could you step us through? And do you have an exercise to get super curious? So we have this gal, a friend of mine, mm -hmm. who's, gosh, what am I going to do? I'm constantly, I have no freedom, no control. I'm sucked in this, mm -hmm. you know, misery, miserable cycle of, of That's trouble. Cool. Right. Absolutely. And so the, there's a bunch of questions that you ask in here, like, what do I need to say, do, or be for my highest good? What am I experiencing right now? What is asking to be met here? What am I ready to see? What am I, you know, yes. can you step us through an exercise or, or maybe I, you can use me as a client and I'll kind of just kind of, I'm trying to figure out how someone would use this practically. Can you well, show us how? Let's step back a bit. What I did in this book is that at the end of each chapter is what's called the remembering session. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I want people to get this sense that we live in the head, our thoughts in our head. We have 65,000 thoughts a day. And, and if people want to, or they're watching this, just put, do your finger and just follow it all around. You can get a prick at your neck doing this. Right. This is what we do all day long. Yeah, it's making me stressed out. I need to oh, drink no. now. Right there. So what we learn how to do is... We recognize that the muscle of our curiosity is very flaccid. It just falls into yeah. a thought after right. another. If, if, the, if the storyteller says, oh, my God, my parents are going to divorce me because I'm not going to go to medical school or whatever, we just follow it. So it's very important to it strengthen the muscle of your curiosity. So there's 10 weeks, and it, it starts with just a few minutes a day, and you develop over time this curiosity and then we start developing the heart that we talked about, the ability to bring spaciousness to this struggling self. Mm. So what that looks like is that here is the this 65,000 thoughts a day, and you begin to notice something other than the stories. <laughs> you know, and believe you me, you know, I meditated, you know, every day for decades, but for 10 years before that, I was a part-time meditator and a closet failure mm -hmm. because I wasn't able to control these thoughts and I thought that's what you know I was going to enlightenment I was going to leave all this stuff right. behind and then thank God I met uh, a very uh, one of the most aware hearts on this planet a man called Stephen Levine 
who has written many books on death and dying, but really, truly is all about how to be fully alive. And that's when I began to realize that to choose a focus, whether it's the sounds around you or your morning cup of tea, or when you're ready to be intimate with yourself, your breath, then uh, um, you, you're going to notice it. And then you're going to go away. Of course you're going to go away. But in a way, it's a good thing you get caught in because then you say, oh, no, wait, pay attention to story. And then you bring your attention back to the focus so that you actually are strengthening this muscle of attention. Mm -hmm. And where this begins to hit you is exactly what you talked about with this young woman. The more you begin to notice there's something going on here, mm -hmm beyond your story about it, mm -hmm. okay? Then you begin to become curious. You begin to realize that you're caught in this prison of struggle. And there begins to become this longing to be available to life again. Mm -hmm. And that's when you begin to use the challenges of your life. There's a whole chapter about how your challenges are for you. Mm -hmm. And it's like I said earlier, they're not here because you screwed up or you know they screwed up or god fell asleep on the job your challenges are here specifically to bring up all of the struggle your version of struggle mm -hmm. and the easiest way to see that in the beginning is in your body mm -hmm. and so here she was you two were talking and she just you asked her you know what are you experiencing right now this lifts you out of this story tell her, oh my god oh my god my god Oh, I'm feeling this vice and I'm feeling this lump in my throat. To this mind, that's a fart in the wind. <laughs> right. To, to who we really are, that's a moment of consciousness. And that moment matters. In that moment, you are relating to what you are experiencing rather than from it. And the body can help immensely because so mm -hmm. many of the spells, you know, I, uh, the core spell I took on was dread. Mm -hmm. And dread is this horrible feeling, this dropping sensation in your belly that something really bad is going to happen. And it's going to happen because you did something wrong. And I tried to drink it away, drug it away. I once gained 97 pounds in a year. I tried to kill myself three times, mm -hmm. put myself in a mental hospital, all to try to get away from this dread. Mm -hmm. And as I learned how to strengthen the muscle, dread was not something I went to at the beginning. But as my muscle got stronger, I became curious about dread, how it lived in me. And I set it free mm -hmm. by giving it my attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that enough uh, or do you want us to go No, I think actually what I think that what was interesting is when we talked and she actually tuned in to that inner wisdom, what she did get was, you know what, I, I made some bad decisions. There are consequences of them. They were hurtful and I can move on. You know, yeah. I, I can move on and... You know, I can, I, I, and so that was where she left. So it's, you know, I'm experiencing a sense of more calm and peace that this is just, it is what it is. Yes. Yeah. But and what I want to add to that is she made no bad decisions. Yeah. She really didn't. That life is in charge of life. And uh, there, there, uh, Trumpa Rinpoche, who is uh, Pema Children, she's the Buddhist nun, uh, you know, very well-known Buddhist nun, uh, Trimble was mm -hmm. her teacher. And I did a synopsis of a chapter in his book called The Myth of Freedom, and I love this. It said, uh, without confusion, there would be no wisdom. Mm -hmm. Chaos is workable, not regressing. Mm -hmm. Respect whatever happens. Chaos should be regarded as extremely good news. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yeah. So the, the, this says this is a good bad. I'm right wrong. Now. I made a bad decision. No, 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 no bad decisions. Life puts us in these situations that bring up all of this struggle, so that we can begin to see it and relate to it. I mean, for heaven's sakes, you know, I was locked in a mental hospital 
for the better part of a year when I was 23, and now I travel the world. How did I get there? Right. Not by fixing myself, not by changing anything, not by trying to get rid of it, but to actually experience what I was experiencing, experiencing and bring it the healing balm of my own heart. Mm. So that dread, it calmed down. It's still there. It's, uh, you know, it used to be 110% of me. Now it's 5% of me. <laughs> you put me in the right situation, it will rise up. But I know how to be with it rather than to fall into it or try to run away from it. Right. So it's when you're getting yeah. into those, you called it wily coyote moments. <laughs> you know, when you're in those situations. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. To just kind of get curious. And, and what's interesting in terms of what she was experiencing is this kind of sense of impatience, a sense of doubt and fear. And to just meet it and say, ah, oh, fear is here. What is it that I'm experiencing now? What's asking to be met here with this fear? Yeah, exactly. What am I ready to see with this fear? Yes. What do I need? Uh, am, um, how? What is the way through this? Yes. And how can I serve? And what's interesting is I think actually after going through this experience, her major aha was she said, you know what? I'm realizing that so much of these decisions that were driven in my life were to please others. Yes. Geez. And I have to say no. And yes. honor my path, which I, yes. like, oh, if, beautiful. like, if there was any huge life moment at that point, it's that, you know, so all that pain, like, if that's, if you can get that at an early age, isn't that a gift? It's a very great gift. And if you can really understand, it, 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 the great way to look at it is that uh, a baby is born through contractions. Mm. There isn't a crowbar in there opening up the cervix. Right. You know, here is these contractions that then the cervix lets go a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And if we really truly know that discomfort is our God, that discomfort is not something to resist. Discomfort is showing us where our energy is bound up. Mm. So, and if we come and be with it, whether it's the physical discomfort of a headache or, uh, you know, the fallout from chemo, the physical or, illness or yeah. whatever pain people. Yeah or, yeah. yeah. or your mate, uh, betrays you or mm -hmm. all of these things. We have always lived with this butterfly net and this fly <laughs> I love that. And now we're putting them down and we're standing there and saying life what are you showing me here? Mm. We are no longer the victim to our life. It's not happening to us. It's happening for us. Mm. And that's when your energy opens up again like you were when you were a child. You know, it's it's delightful. It, even in the great challenges. I'm in the middle of a, of a very great challenge. A very, very close family member's cancer has come back. Mm, sorry. You know, and believe you me, it, it, it isn't that I'm spacious all the time. Right. But there are times when I just watch his suffering. It is just, you know, it, it, everything inside of me contracts. But then immediately I see that and I bring my accepting attention to that and it relaxes and then I am back with him mm. when I was caught in my fear and my despair then I was no longer with him mm. I was separated mm -hmm. from him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so mm. this is gifting me at a very deep level and you know what I don't have to like it right I don't have to like it but I trust it Yes, I love it. All right, we're talking to Mary O'Malley, and we have been talking about her book, What's in the Way is the Way. Thank you so much for being on the show and to um, uh, guide us through uh, meditation and all experiences. I think that, um, folks, if you want to actually live more consciously, learn the art of surrender, uh, it's kind of a step-by-step -step process, I would yes. say, to show you how to do that week by week, remembering what we have forgotten uh, because of our, after our first six years, like we've forgotten when, how to get back in the meadow. Thank you so much for being, but tell us your website information. Okay. What's your uh, website? MaryOMalley.com. Okay. And it's M-A-R-Y-O-M-A-L-L-E-Y. Uh, -E if they want to see all the amazing endorsements this book has, Go to what's in the way is the way dot com. Great. Thank you so much. You are welcome. So glad to be here. 
It means so much to me that you're listening to the show. I would love your support in any way by giving me comments below or to subscribe to the show or share the show with friends. Thank you again for your support. Love and blessings.